Garwin Sanford, thank you for being with us today, sir. Thanks for asking. What have you been doing op occupying your time since you last appeared on Atlantis? Actually, the business had slowed down a bit before Atlantis picked me up in that, and then all of a sudden things just took off again. Starting last June, I did a, a lead in Merlin's Apprentice with Sam Neill and Miranda Richardson. And I got to play the King of Camelot, Lord Weston. <laughs> King Arthur has passed away 50 years nigh on, and, and now Camelot's in trouble because the Holy Grail has disappeared, and no one knows why. We all think there's something wrong, and there is. Turns out it's me. <laughs> but <laughs> but I'd, it was nice. I'd been growing my hair because you don't get to grow your hair much in the business. So I actually was growing it again. I hadn't had it long since Hawkeye, which was like, you know, 15, 13 years ago. So I started to grow it. At each job I got, they said, no, no, we like it. Keep it, keep it. And then this came along. So I actually got to have it down to my shoulders for the first time. And it's my hair. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. I, it was, you know, armor riding horses, you know, fighting barbarians and being noble, and then turning out that actually I'm um, not that noble. Where was that shot? Was that shot up here? Yeah, all here. Maple Ridge mostly. Really? Yeah, they, okay. they built a fort out on uh, a studio where, where were they filming also? They had filmed s the Three Musketeers series, whatever that's called. I don't know the name of it, but anyway. They built a complete fort out there. It was absolutely fabulous, actually. We had a great time. And David Wu directed, and uh, Mike and Matthew O'Connor produced for Hallmark. So oh, it was a miniseries. Okay. okay. It was f nine weeks of heaven. I just, you know, except for wearing chainmail armor. <laughs> a little heavy. In heat. Well, most shows I, f I find out since then wear, use rubber. So it's yes. light, but no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. They, li they didn't like the way the rubber flowed, so they used actually al it's aluminum links oh, as opposed gosh. to. So, but I still, I, I, get, I go there in the morning and I weigh about 200 pounds, 195. By the time I'd finished putting on the boots, the chain mail, the, all the whole lot, the sword, I weighed 260 pounds. Holy cow, that's a lot of armor. So you just all of a sudden, you gain, you know, I went, wow. So actually, by the end of that nine weeks, you'd picked up, you, you didn't notice it after a while because you got used to it, but it was a fabulous shoot. Would that help with the performance at all, that weight, like a mask would? I think it does. I mean, some actors say, uh, hogwash. But again, <laughs> what you, I mean, always don't you try to have what they would have. Now, the armorer, the, the props guy, gave us a couple of pieces of real chainmail armor. And just the headpiece mm -hmm. weighed as much as my whole body piece mm -hmm. did. Like you, they, you know, they've dug up, you know, skeletons of old knights who were mm -hmm. short enough to begin with, but all their, everything was compressed. And you found that, in a 12-hour filming day, you had to actually lay down a cup. Just oh my god! You had to take 15 minutes and just cut because you can't get out of the stuff. It takes a lot of time to get in and out. So, but you, I, I discovered that after a few days of this, I went. I know what I have to do. I have to lay down for about 15 minutes somewhere in the middle of the day just to kind of take the weight off. But it was, uh, you know, it's amazing to gain that much weight in one go. Did you get to know your chiropractor very well during this time? <laughs> Luckily, nothing fell out of place. Okay. Good. An aging actor's cry. Uh, <laughs> But it was, it was a lot of fun, and I loved working with David Wu, and uh, Sam Neill was a before? lot of fun. No, I had never oh. have. Oh. And he, he's now filming something in China. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the Thief, or something. I can't remember the name of it. Okay. But he's fabulous to work for. We had a great time. I nice. really enjoyed that. And then things just started picking up. I did a movie in Toronto called, a comedy called uh, Recipe for Perfect Christmas. Guys I'd worked with, with in uh, Victoria before. And then I came back and did a movie called, well, they're not sure yet, Eyes or Night Vision 2. It was a feature that, they had, that was originally going to be Wesley Snipes, and somehow that all fell apart, so they decided to make a straight-to-video deal. Tretch was in it. He was a, a rapper. <laughs> and uh, Nia Peebles. So I got to play this, the head of the Secret Service who protects the president's wife. And I'm not such a nice guy. <laughs> I, I love playing bad guys. It's fun. And then I just guest starred on Evidence, um, which is a new series they're filming in Vancouver. So it's actually, it's just sort of picked up. It's been great. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Are you a fan of science fiction? Well, since I was about, well, I've told this story before and people think I'm nuts, but I was, you know, 13, I think, and I discovered Keith Lorimer's Retief series. Now, this stuff is not high science fiction, 
But uh, <laughs> when I was 13, I thought it was very cool. It's like a 007 in space, basically. Yeah. And uh, that's what started me on that. Okay. And then I graduated to Sturgeon and Silverberg and okay. Clark and Bradbury and, you know, and, and for years, that's well, the only thing I read. And then after college, I started flying planes and, and then acting came along and the science fiction all kind of went to others. And now I don't know who anybody is anymore. <laughs> I still just go back and read the old guys over again, you know, and do, Frank Herbert, you know, yes. I, that's the kind of the newest. I actually met him uh, at one point. You met Frank Herbert? Yeah. And oh, I, darn. I had to haul out my copy of Dune for him to sign. <laughs> I'm actually in the middle but, of it right now. That's one of the greatest oh, science fiction it novels is. of all time. It's, uh, I haven't read the newest one that his son and someone mm -hmm. has collaborated on. I haven't read those yet. Uh, I saw it in the bookstore the other day and I kept going, oh, I didn't want to spoil it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure. I haven't heard any reviews one way or the other. And Kirk Vonnegut, of course, uh, and who I did actually, I was filming a series called Stories from the Monkey House, <laughs> okay. which was... Um, an episode, uh, uh, anthology series. When I was living in LA at the time, they flew me up to Calgary to film it. And Vonnegut came to do the beginning um, talk, you know, where he does, he'd introduce each episode, mm -hmm. sort of like doing the, uh, uh, what was the, uh, Alfred Hitchcock thing for, you know. So Vonnegut and Stan Daniels, who was directing, who wrote for Mary Tyler Moore and then created mm -hmm. Cheer, no, no, Taxi, mm -hmm. stuff like this. They all decided they're going to the Banff Film Festival, so the three of us got in a car and drove to Banff and back. Spending five hours with Kurt Vonnegut and Stan Daniels was one of my favorite things of all time. Oh, darn. Vonnegut, I love his work. I've always loved his stuff. Oh, Slachthouse Fump, you know, Slaughterhouse Five. <laughs> so we, we started talking about his books, of course. And he said, um, I asked him about what it's like when he's, you know, people are always coming up at, when we were there. People are pesting him all the time. So he told this great story. He said, in Breakfast of Champions, um, well, first of all, we'll so what happened? The guy asked for his autograph. So he drew this kind of little asterisk looking thing and then wrote, you know, blah, blah, blah. The guy asked him, he said, what's this? What is that? And he goes, and of course, the guy had said he was a fan of all his books, read them all many, many times. And he didn't get it, because in Breakfast of Champions, there's a line drawing of a <laughs> hole. Oh. Sorry, sphincter, <laughs> sphincter. So it looks like a little asterisk in the middle of the page. You know, it's a line drawing of an asshole. And he goes, "That's because you are one for asking for, my, for asking for my autograph." <laughs> but he'd been going on how he knew, uh, read uh, all the books, and was, you know, it's the people that effuse that way. I love that. That's kind of Vonnegut wrapped up in a nutshell. He's quite a <laughs> wonderful man, but he's he's quite caustic at times. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that has nothing to do with what you asked, but no, it does, sort of. That's all right. Can you take us back to the beginning of your involvement with SG-1? Um, how did you get Nareem? I was filming a show in Africa, in South Africa. Oh. And the day before I was flying back, my agent phoned and said, um, Stargate's phone and said they'd like you to guest star in the next episode. And I, he said, but the thing is, you start the day after you get back. And I'd been there for six weeks, I guess. So you fly to London, then you fly here. Uh -huh. You're already flipping your hours majorly. And then I said, well, can they get me a script? But he said, no, because it was three days before. So I said, OK, so um, can they get it to me in London? And apparently, they, I said, the airport. The London airport takes no courier. They take no packages. And I went, oh, right, of course, right. They've been suffering under terrorism for a lot longer than everybody else mm. with the IRA, so they won't take any packages. I said, okay, fine. So I fly in, and then th that night I pick up the script. Next morning you're in wardrobe. The next morning you start filming. Yeah. So I was like a, I had, I uh, Exactly. <laughs> I was tired. I was kind of jet lagged. I was like trying to get my lines. Uh, they told me, and I hadn't. I didn't know a lot about the show at the time because I had been working and I hadn't seen yeah. much of it. Because I think that was the second season. It was wasn't the first. It? Was it the first season? Mm -hmm. So they said Amanda Tapping, and I again I had no idea. Uh, I said okay, that's great, whatever. And they said you're sort of a love interest for her. Mm -hmm. So I said okay, and they had hired me, uh, uh, Ricky and um, uh, 
the producers had used me in a couple of episodes of MacGyver years before, so they knew who I was. But they'd looked at my tape, apparently, uh, my, de my new demo to see what I was up to, and then apparently that's what they gave Amanda, saying, here, what do you think? And she said, oh, that was kind of neat, because they'd never asked up to that point, you know, if they were interested, this guy might be your love interest, do you want to... So she had input, and she goes, yeah, I thought, whatever, I guess she must have said yes, because I was there. But, um, I mean, I had no idea the experience it was going to become. Um, working with Amanda was, and that's who I worked with almost the whole episode. Right. I mean, yeah, I didn't have much to do with really anybody hard, else. Isn't it? it was really rough. And uh, <laughs> that kissing scene was so horrible. I think I asked them to do it again about, I don't know, eight or ten times. <laughs> and I said, is that it? Can we do it from another angle? Um, I've been in the business a long time, but um, that's the best screen kiss I've ever had. Ever. From the from, original episode? From Amanda. I mean, it was like, um, you know, it wasn't hot and heavy. It was just this wonderful, like, romantic. It was fab, and she's fabulous. I when totally, you did, in love, totally in love with her. When you did eventually get the script, what did the breakdown say about the Tolans? What was your first impression of this society? In fact, the breakdown, I never got one. I got the script that night. The next morning, there was no breakdown explaining who they were. When I got there, I talked to Bill. Bill Garrity directed the first one I did, I think. And Bill and we just started talking about what it, what you know, because I was defining sort of me and Omak. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we were kind of defining who they were, and little did we know that we, you know, had to find a society that has really bad leaders who <laughs> can't make a decision to save their life, and when they right. do, it's always wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we're so technologically advanced, we've wiped out every other living thing on the planet but us. <laughs> you know, the more advanced you are technolo you know, technology, we think that's good, but in somehow it's, uh, you're affecting your society and your environment to its detriment. The better you are at that, the more advanced you are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> come on. But, you know, we were supposed, uh, we, we kind of decided that he was very polite and, and we kind of played with, it's very traditional to have aliens, you know, not speaking with contractions and stuff. But yeah. we'd, We've played with that, and Bill and I talked about it. He goes, I don't really want to go there, but it was, we found that they were very formal. Yes. You know, very formal people, and we decided that was kind of how we were going to start from, is that we made them very proper. They have etiquette that they follow, and it's a very regimented series of things that make them mm -hmm. respond the way they do. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, you'd never know it from Omak. Well, yeah, he just kind of did his own thing. <laughs> <laughs> he was fun, uh, but the, the whole the whole basis of it was is that I am supposedly you know the pinnacle of what that is supposed to be: yeah. integrity, honor, um, and nonviolent, completely and just very you know. Curiosity. Yes, huge. And you're, the the thing that drove us the most was the trying to discover and push the boundaries of our own technology, which obviously we could. We could walk through walls and stuff, which mm -hmm. was cool. Uh, <laughs> and, and of course, uh, I love the thing about not sharing with anybody because you know we'd already destroyed one civilization, right? Two of them actually. Sarita, and then yeah, what was the other one? That's very good. I don't remember the other one. Yeah, there were there were a few of them. Yeah, that's why it explains why they're kind of isolated. Like, no, no, yeah. you don't want to know us. No, no, we <laughs> we we mess up everything we touch. <laughs> uh, but I like the fact that he was kind of a milk toast. He was just so. Mm -hmm. You know, but what I liked about what they did with the characters, they gave him such an arc. Mm -hmm. By the time I did the last episode that I filmed, he had to step up to the plate. Mm -hmm. You know, and I remember Michael Greenberg coming and saying about filming that last episode, because the middle episode I was kind of just you know pretense. This yeah, way. here you are. Step this way. Come this way. Yeah. I, I made a joke every time I please this way. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and then I walked through the wall at one point and kind of saved them. But regardless, it was come this way. Yes. Uh, so I was the butler in that episode. But um, in the next one, <laughs> Michael was a bit concerned. They, they were. They had written the episode with, apparently up until that point, it was the largest guest star role that had been written. Normally it's about everybody in the show and the guest stars fit in. And this time, Narim was basically yeah. in charge of the whole nine yards he was running in all this most of the scenes and, and it had carried a lot for a guest star which they hadn't done before and they were a little concerned because he is such a milk toast you know kind of always you know and they were wondering oh my god what have we done because we're going to end up with an episode that's mm -hmm. just kind of like uh, uh you know and i also when i read it i realized that was the case but it was about narim having to step up mm -hmm. you know it's like okay fine and and it gave him an arc of 
extreme conflict within himself mm -hmm. to go against the society mm -hmm. because I'm fighting the authority figures at the time. But I did what was right, you know, basically. So that must have been a really rewarding experience it was for the other two. And it was fun, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was nice to have the, the fact that he actually did this arc. He actually went somewhere. Instead of just being the same guy every episode, he changed, right? Yeah. And there had been talk, some talk about how what was going to happen if he came back. Um, and of course, they never finished. They didn't do that. Right. But uh, I wish they had of because they were going to take him a whole new way. Well, you got this great episode, and then oh, by the way, you basically commit your race to death. So, so I guess it's a sacrifice that must be made. Well, the, but the choice. The thing is, is if we'd given them what it was the right thing to do, they would have killed you anyway, probably. Oh, of course. Because they go old, right? Yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, honor among thieves. But um, mm -hmm. basically, if we had given them the, the weapons that they wanted, they're they're absolutely invulnerable. They would wipe out the whole place. So it's like it's stepping up again. Him stepping up in many ways. He could have run away too. I love the fact they gave him the choice to leave. They said, "Well, you can come with us." Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I have like, to. Yeah. Stay with my I thought that was kind of good. The John Wayne thing to do, you know. So yeah. it's kind of fun for him again. But that's the integrity thing stepping in, right? Yeah, right. But overall, I mean, the biggest thing about this, the thing that runs Narim's character is the fact that he's so much in love with Samantha. He's just absolutely. Do you think he did what he did for her so she would survive? Besides, yes, his people as well, but. I hadn't thought of that before. No. He did, it, of course. He gets to save the girl and be the guy on the white horse, but um, it was more about the, the bigger picture. If they all had to die for this, it was just I'm glad that they could make it. We were able to get let they could get to the gate and go, yeah. right? You I'm, saved Earth. Yeah, really pleased yeah. about that. You know, that was a good thing. And you know, um, if but if it had cost their lives as well, it would have been worth it because of what we were giving up. You know, uh, again, our leaders. This, this advanced race has a bunch of leaders that just can't think mm -hmm. past next Themselves, week or something, yeah, I can, exactly. you know, which I thought was interesting. Uh, we never did see the Curia, but it, I think it would have been interesting to see them. They probably would have been pretty much as you've described, very <laughs> bland and <laughs> boring and not thinking much other than themselves. Yeah. So. Yes, basically. It's been almost five years since we last seen him. Is he dead? Is Nareem dead, you think? Or you, do you I'd like, hold out hope? I, I would love to do more of these. I, again, working with Amanda is, and, mm -hmm. and the Kang. The, I mean, Christopher Judge, him and I go back to a, a, a series called Booker with Richard Grieco. And I did, um, they had, had offered me a regular role to start, and then I wasn't sure about the series, so I said, why don't we... We, we don't know what it is yet. Why don't we do a couple episodes and see what we come up with? And then they changed producers, and we did. They said, well, we have to do another one, new producers. And it happened two or three times. And I'd finally done about six or seven episodes as one of the investigator kind of guys at, at this place. Anyway, he was in that also. So I love working with Christopher. I love working with Ricky. I'd like, the, the, guy, the gang is it's just fun. Mm -hmm. But it, most of my stuff is always with Amanda. And mm -hmm. of course, that's hard to take. <laughs> No, it was just really fun. I love her. She has an actor, and it's great. And I'd love to do more. I mean, I know they had there'd been rumors about they'd actually talked to me uh, at the party for the hundredth episode about what they thought they were going to do with him, and then they must have changed their mind because it didn't come to being. But I'm not. What gonna, did they think they were going to? Well, I can't uh, just in case they decide to do it. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag. Can you give us a little? <laughs> not a word. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, just in case. Okay. You know, I, I think that they, I think Narim's gone. I really okay. do. I mean, I just would love to do more of them because I, I enjoyed working on this, it, and it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. And with you having the luck with the women, uh, Stargate Atlantis. Were you asked to play Simon? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, they just said this is the role we'd like you to do, and that was flattering and fun, and and we had talked about. I'd asked them before about, you know, what's the reality of these worlds, you know? And they said, it's fine, you know, we can bring people in from this because Atlantis is a new deal. It is the same universe, however. Mm -hmm. But apparently the fan, there's been a bit of fan reaction to that. 
by you having the, the same I face saw, in two different parts? Yeah, they said, well, they didn't even do anything to change him. You know, there were there were some people that were upset that really? Marim had become a human. <laughs> It's the same guy. It's the same guy. Vancouver's only so big. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but I, I, you know, I, I thought it was nice because they they liked kind of my approach yeah. to what I've been doing, and it was really it was fun to do. And of course, they they uh, I think they in the long run decided that it wasn't going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So they found a way to you know, fit you back in. Get, yeah, but also get me out. Yes, exactly. Yeah, to say um, I found someone else, honey. Sorry. Yeah. Well, right. Right. It, but ties her up. What are you going to do with storylines? Mm -hmm. If she has a husband or a boyfriend back on Earth, rather, how does and she's not? I don't go with her. Then, then she can't have any real. Uh, yeah. It just ties up a lot of stuff. I mean, how often do they come back to Earth? Right. You know? So I think they did the right thing. They really did. That one of the big questions is: Was Simon Elizabeth's husband or just her boyfriend? What was the <laughs> is that another? Do you, do you know for sure which one he was? Because they never specifically say. And yeah. some of the producers have said he is her husband. Yes. Okay. Then I, if the producers have said it, so can I. In the first <laughs> episode, I was her husband. Oh. Okay. And then in the second episode, I was still her husband because it was a dream sequence. Home. Yeah. Where? She, yeah. Exactly. Where they've come back. Not a dream sequence, but the aliens give them, you know, the uh -huh. ability to live out their life as they would like uh -huh. to have had it happen. And I think they realized that they painted themselves into a bit of a corner with the character. What are they going to do with this guy? Are they going to take me to, you know, and make me a regular on the series? And Which would tie her down. Yeah, exactly. I just think that they realized that it wasn't a good place to go. They saw where the show was headed, and they realized that I think, and I think they made the right choice for the show. I think it's a smart choice, unfortunately for me. But, uh, uh, so, then they, when they brought me back, they changed my name. Wallace. But, uh, yes, and and the, so the thing was is that I and I don't think in the first episodes they even had my last name on the credits. So they were able to they look back and I think they decided and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. That's how you do shows. It's like shows you look at them, you just start something off, and then you realize this isn't going to service us about the storytelling. And it, that's as far as I'm concerned, that's always where you have to go. I, I at the moment I. Um, I'm in charge of the acting department at a film arts school up here called Lancaster College, called Film Arts Branch. Uh, two years ago, they asked me if I would head this up. I had been my alma mater was Studio 58, which is the theater school at Lancaster College up here in Vancouver. And I used to teach them some film stuff. And they asked me to get involved in starting this film branch, which we did two years ago. This is our second year, and we teach them how to make short films. And this is what I keep telling them over and over and over again, is the most important thing is the story. Mm -hmm. Story, story. I'll forgive production values. I'll forgive everything if your story follows through. And the series starts to develop. You have an idea where it's going, but until your characters start living it, where do you take it? And they saw where it was going, and I didn't fit in. So, I've heard a couple of fans mention your artwork. Does that ring any bells? Yeah, I do. Um, I've done pen and ink for years, but uh, about five years ago, when the business slowed down here for a while, I started sculpting in clay. And I'd never worked in clay before. I've always been interested in masks and things because of theater work. Uh -huh. I'd done Commedia dell'arte, I'd done a neutral mask and character mask under Wendy Gorling, uh, again at that theater school. And she's amazing. She's, a, she's brilliant, actually. She's a genius as far as I'm concerned, comes to mask work. And uh, under mask is where I learned to become an actor. It taught me, uh, all of a sudden when I was under mask, I felt like mm -hmm. poof, I had power mm -hmm. and everything could free up. And it took me a little while, but then I caught on and went, oh, right, every character is a mask. Exactly. G -g -g -g. So that was like, <laughs> I, so I thank Wendy Gorling for that little ding ding. But anyway, so I've always loved masks. I said, okay, I had nothing to, but time. I wanted to make some masks. So I put my hands in clay at a friend's place. A guy who runs a studio uh, and uh, has a studio of his own, he's a potter. He said, I got some old clay sitting over there if you want it. It was raku clay. He said, it's, it's, it's a little dry, but you can use it. So I did, and I made the first one. And he walks and he goes, oh, you've done this before? And I said, no, I haven't, actually. <laughs> I said, but it's turning out all right. Somehow I was able to translate all the years of drawing and all, because I've always, when I draw, it's always, fa it's always portraiture. It's always faces done, mixtures somehow. There's always faces in it. And all of a sudden, it just I went, ooh, right. So I found the medium that I wanted to, three-dimensional representation. So I spent a few months. I had uh, someone say, well, you're going to go take classes, because it's raku, it's very difficult. And I said, no. 
They said, well, how are you going to learn? I said, by doing it, mm -hmm. right? Because I figured that if you, it's just like anything, acting, art, no matter what it is, if you go Practice. and have someone show you how to do it, somehow you'll buy the limitations that they present to you or whatever. If you discover it on your own, this is one of the, re I think, I've often wondered why certain things seem to be stagnant in our society. And I think it's because if you want to learn to do something, you always go with somebody else to learn how to do it, as opposed to finding your own way. Finding your own way you know? And I've always, uh, my wife thinks I'm crazy, but uh, it's like I've always wanted to be a Renaissance man. Like, you know, <laughs> and and that, uh, the whole idea appealed to me greatly, right? Because like I flew planes, I'm into science, I like astronomy, I like uh, music, I have guitar and I play piano and I play the harp, a uh, little lap harp and all these, oh, like uh, all these things, I just want to keep expanding and I want to keep you know, being a jack of all trades and master of none. But you keep pushing and pushing the envelope, right? And it's like the only way you can do that is to do it yourself because then you'll discover something that's in here. Mm -hmm. this, this then gets expressed in a very clear way because it's the only... So I went and I just found my own technique to make these things, how you build underbody, how I dealt with the fact that I'm building pieces that are pushing the limits of the clay and also the limits of what Raku is because you have to heat them to 1800 degrees really quickly. Don't they blow up? I have potters come up and say, you can't do that. How did you do that? You know, and I said, well, and I'd explain what I'd done because I just thought about thermodynamics. Okay, if it's going to be this, I've got to heat it slower. You're the pilot coming in there. <laughs> right. So you, have, so you have all of these things that you mix together. But what it ended up is me making, like in the first six months, I'd made 60 pieces. Holy cow. And they had most of them had survived. Uh, you know, I'd lost a few, but most of them had turned out reasonably well because I thought about what I want to do with them. Yeah. And this potter friend of mine said, what are you going to do with them? And I said, I don't know. I, said, I, was, I lived in a log house at the time, five acres in the woods, and I built my log house, another one of those dreams, which I, and I built it myself. But anyway, you, got, you can put it wherever you want, right? You know, it's like, they, I said, but the house is filling up. What am I going to do with this stuff? <laughs> and you're very covetous of these things in the beginning. Yeah, you know, like, you know, ooh, these, I got it. And then after it's like 60 or 70, I'll get them out. Go away, go away. Oh, yeah. So he said, do a show. And I said, no one's, they're very gothic. Very, they're born in fire and smoke. They're very, they're gothic. And there's some very um, strange pieces. But anyway, um, I didn't assume a lot of people were going to be interested in this type of stuff. Most of them have their mouths open, empty eyes, like they're, they're cut outs like Greek mm -hmm. statuary, and some of them don't, but lots of uh, various themes, but they all end up being kind of gothic in their approach. And th did you want this story to be this long? <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, I did my first show and sold 15 on the weekend. And oh, I went, darn. Okay. Good for you. So I started doing things like here in Vancouver, they have a big thing called Circle Craft. So I, and you have to submit, and not many people get in. They accepted me. I did a couple of years there. I sold 30 on the, uh, so uh, now I've sold like 90 pieces. And it's been, and I keep pushing the limits. are getting bigger and bigger. And I'm, uh, I've done armor pieces I did. And then people come when they shows, they ask me to do stuff. And because the pieces are very unusual, science fiction pops into it all the time. And I had someone ask me to do Mao Dib. I asked. The Greek mythology, they want me to do the Medusa pieces because it's all of it. So I've been doing pieces for people. I've done commissioned pieces and I've been doing, but basically it's about pushing my limits as I push everything else. Okay. So it's been a lot of fun actually. It's like, it's been, I often wonder when things start to fall apart in one area for one reason or another, what do you do? You go, okay, life is the <laughs> Oops, can I say that? <laughs> uh, or, Every time a problem arises, it's an, um, an opportunity to find a creative way to overcome and make your life better. Mm -hmm. And I exam it's just making anything, projects, art, movies. It's always going to be something getting in your way. Well, fun. use that as a reason to step beyond yourself and make it better. Mm. Anyway. Last question real quick. If you're done with Stargate, what do you want fans to remember about your performances on the shows? If you never go back, which is unlikely, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, that I was in love with Sam. <laughs> well, aren't we all? <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> no. Uh, basically, that's it. I mean, that's it. Yeah, I often wanted him to, uh, them to, in the last episode, he pops in and takes her and rides off into the sunset. <laughs> hey, I've been gone, baby. You hear that, Sam? <laughs> yeah, we made Joe, actually, um, they, I, I didn't get to do it because there was... Sam had to cancel, but uh, Amanda had canceled, but there was a, they were going to do a, uh, a uh, convention mm -hmm. in England with just her meeting her privately. And um, 
Brian Cooney phoned and said, would you come and we'll surprise her, you'll just come out. And I said, yes, I would love to do this. That would have been a lot of fun. And uh, we, Jared Bourne and I know each other, and he was, yeah. we were talking about if we could get the two of us to show up and we could have a fight on stage over her, but it was like, <laughs> <laughs> Mel Mack, I keep calling him Mel Mack. <laughs> He stole my girl, Mel Mac, and they go, no, it's not Mark, it's Mark Toof. I said, what? What was that, Mark what? No, Mel Mac. 